I'm Adrian Lawson, a data analyst at the Linux Foundation research team. Um, I'm working very closely with Stephen Hendrick on the quantitative research side of um, the research team's activities. Um, and today's talk is going to be about, well, I named it asymmetries in open source, but it's really going to be about the consumption contribution gap that we're seeing within our research and um, ways to improve the sustainability of OSS. Okay, I'll go ahead and then people will join. Um, so the research is based on the Global Spotlight 2023 um, survey, which follows the 2022 Europe Spotlight survey, but this time we took a worldwide approach and um, tried to cover as many regions of the world as we can. The objectives of the study was to examine current levels of activity of open source, assess usage and contribution patterns, uh, mainly within organizations and whether organizations are using or contributing to open source. Um, also to identify inhibitors and motivators. So why is it that organizations are not that willing to contribute or whether they are using a lot of open source and why is that? Also to explore opportunities in the open source landscape. Um, recognize the growing reliance on open source that we usually see, but it's nice to see confirmed in the data. Um, also to understand the perceived value of open source. Um, investigate its benefits and challenges, strengths and weaknesses. So this is what we set out to do with the survey with the 44, 43 questions. Um, just a little bit about methodology. Uh, we distributed this survey between April to June of 2023. The regional distribution of the sample looks like 33% is from the Americas, 34% is from Europe, 27% from Asia Pacific, and then 7% 7, 7 from other regions, which are um, very much lumped together. Um, and this is because we weren't able to gather that much data from those regions, which is an issue, uh, but should be discussed at another uh, session. Um, our sample sizes for the Europe sample, because we're Open Source Summit Europe, um, I thought that there would be some findings where I would highlight the European sample and uh, respondents. Um, that includes 307 usable responses. Um, and for the global sample, we have more than 900 um, people who started the survey. And then, of course, it's a 43. Um, uh, it's quite a long survey, so we did have people dropping out throughout, but we still um, made use of their responses before their dropout. All right, now going into the results. Um, so I'm talking about this consumption contribution gap. Well, what is that and why do we see it in the data and how did we kind of measure it? Well, one thing, and um, that's why I titled this um, presentation as asymmetries in open source, because there is definitely an asymmetry between open source use policies and contribution policies. Here um, on the horizontal axis, it's about, all about contribution. And then the more we go to the right, um, more, also, more the policy is uh, open and permissive. So on the right, it's OSS contributions are openly encouraged, whereas on the left, OSS contributions are not at all permitted. And then on the vertical axis, it's the same thing, but for usage policy. Um, and if it was fully symmetrical, we would see um, most of the percentages on the diagonal, and we would hope to see as many organizations in the top right corner, um, where, pe where uh, organizations are openly encouraging use as well as contributions. Uh, but as you can see, it kind of shifts to the left a little bit, so more organizations are um, more permissive in their use policies um, compared to their contribution policies. I think another chart that nicely illustrates the difference between um, consumption and contribution is um, this chart where each of the lines are showing a region. So first it's the total, then the Americas, then Europe, Asia Pacific, and then the other regions lumped together. Um, four questions are shown in this graph. The first one is, whether open source is used within the organization and the percentage shows that um, the amount of organizations that say they have widespread or significant or moderate use of open source. So that's around the 90% range as I think all of us kind of um, 
we're thinking, and it's now nice to see confirmed. Then going down to the use policy and whether open source use is encouraged, um, or we also had another answer choice which says open source use is up to each development team within the company. Um, that is around the 70 range, and Asia Pacific goes down to 66% in this case. Um, the third question um, would be about OSS contributions and the policies and whether it's encouraged or up to the development team to decide whether contributions are permitted. That's down to the 60s range. And then the last one is about OSPOs or um, clear and visible strategies. We did try to not fix it to OSPOs because we do know that a lot of companies are not using the term OSPO, but instead, but do have a, a visible and clear strategy. And that, that goes down to the 50, 40s range. In the other category, it's 34%. Um, and it's interesting how in Europe, it's, there, there's a, a kind of widespread use. Um, it's quite encouraged compared to the other regions. But OSPOs and um, visible strategies are not there, um, for example, compared to the uh, level in the Americas. Um, I made also kind of a turn to how is open source used um, because we did ask a lot of questions on, on what are the kind of steps that people are following when they're evaluating OSS components or better to use them. Um, and um, yeah, I think this is a quite an important takeaway. Um, one question was whether people believe that OSS is more secure than closed software. That was 68% uh, of respondents. Um, but the picture is not that clear uh, because in, in another question, we do see that 42% still raise concerns about the security of op open source components. Um, and then if we even go further, it's 24% of organizations who require development training in secure software development. Um, so, although people are raising concerns, it seems that they don't require um, actions that would kind of make sure that they, they can avoid the concerns. And then, um, when people are evaluating whether to use an open source component in their organizations, um, most of them tend to check the activity level or other proxies. Um, and then evaluate whether to use it instead of um, kind of a more direct inspection into the source code, which is of course not possible in every um, situation, but it's nice to see or interesting to see that um, this comes up at top. All right, so what about contribution? How is that going within organizations? Um, so overall, 48% of organizations contributed code to an open source project. We did also ask about whether they contributed non-code assets such as graphics or whether they provided documentation or opened a query um, on Stack Overflow. Um, but uh, when explicitly asked about contribution um, to an open source, or contributing code to an open source project, that was 48%. And that number is 54% in Europe. Um, and um, we also asked about kind of the steps that are followed before or when contributing open source code. Um, and I think it's a nice, there's a nice difference between organizations who do have an OSPO or a clear strategy uh, compared to those who do not. Um, the, sorry, the, the, the dark blue is the, is the, are the organizations with an OSPO and the light Blue is um, organizations without an OSPO. And throughout the steps, we can see that around, um, there's two times more uh, organizations following the different steps, uh, be it code review by peers, or quality assurance testing, or security testing, or uh, even legal approval and sign off. So there's definitely a difference. Um, and then now going into how should we narrow the gap based on the data? Um, um, we did have an explicit question on whether respondents agree uh, that the following actions would increase um, contribution if it was invested in their organizations. And uh, at the top, it was allocating employee time for open source contributions, 
so that their employees are able to, within working hours, within um, their salaries to contribute to open source projects. Um, the 63% said funding open source projects. Um, 62 about, is it 63%? 62% said that providing organization-wide education on the OSS value proposition would increase contributions. And then there were also answer choices about clear policies and open sourcing uh, their own products. All right, so how do we narrow it? But also let's see how much time people are spending contributing to open source projects, be it personal time or uh, within working hours. All right, this is a bit of a complex graph, so let me uh, talk you through it. Um, the bar charts are showing time, the percentage of respondents who said that they are working this much time during the week on open source. So on the left is respondents who said, I'm not working on open source at all, then from one hour per week to all the way to more than 40 hours per week. So just showing, as we, as, we, as we could, uh, it's, it's not surprising, as we're going down to 40 hours, it's less and less respondents saying that they're uh, working on open source. Uh, within the charts, uh, we had different questions on whether they are working on inner source projects or other employer supported projects or a third party open source project. Um, and as you can see, there are differences and most of the people are working on inner source projects and then it's going down um, for third-party projects. Um, the pink bar is showing personal time, so the amount of personal time that people are, are um, spending to contribute. Um, it's a bit of a, it can be a bit confusing because we do have to add the inner source project, employer supported project, and third party projects to get out all of the time spent during working hours. And that does exceed uh, the personal time that people uh, reported in the survey. And then on the right axis, uh, it's about the total hours contributed. Um, and I just wanted to um, add that to the graph so that people can see that even the one or two hours per week do add up. And that means a lot of hours, um, even though there's just a few people contributing more than 40 hours, um, and that adds up as well. So all contributions are equally important, and hopefully employ employers um, see that. Um, so I wanted this talk to be a bit about also um, help to individual contributors within companies so that they um, are able to go to their employers and say, there is value in contributing. I would like you to appreciate that, um, that I can contribute, be it one or two, one to four hours or full, as a full-time assignment. Um, and there are values tied to that. Um, there is definitely a growing value of both use and contribution. So organizations were asked whether over the last year, how has the business value or benefits of your organization derived from OSS use contribution changed? Um, and even for contribution, 46% of organizations said that the value increased uh, just because we contributed. 35% um, says that it has stayed the same and 4% said that it decreased. Going into the specific benefits that contribution brings, um, the question was, how often do OSS contributions in your organization deliver the following benefits? And improved so software quality came up on the top as 52% said always or often. Uh, it also makes the organization a better place to work and um, in an industry sense enables the IT industry to be more innovative. Um, people also mentioned uh, a moral obligation and um, there was also improved security. All right. Um, and now uh, to the limits of contribution, um, where one clear answer could be that, that um, organizations are not seeing a clear return on contribution, a clear revenue back um, but there are actually non-monetary limits um, to why organizations are, are 
not allowing contribution. The first one is actually legal or licensing concerns, um, where the dark blue is people who agree and then um, agree with the statement. Um, the blue is neutral. Um, this greenish is disagree. Then going down is also fear of leaking intellectual property. Um, then a lack of policy or training materials. And then actually a clear lack of return on investment uh, is down to the fourth place. Um, technology constraints and challenges come last. All right, so we also asked about open source sustainability in general, not just in your organization, but in a wider sense, how could we improve sustainability? Um, this question is about the areas of further investment. Um, so in which areas do you think that there should be further investment in open source across our geographic region? And it's segmented by region. Uh, for Europe and the Americas, um, it's government adoption of open source. That's the first that came up top. So government has a special role. Uh, whereas in Asia Pacific, they would like to see better funding of the commercial open source startups ecosystem. Um, then we also see open source alternatives to technology monopolies and better academic education. Uh, whereas in Asia Pacific, it was more about fostering open source global technology standards. And then uh, the third was government adoption of open source. Yeah. And the explicit question of how should open source projects sustainably be improved? 63% um, of respondents said, again, that organizations should allow time during working hours for employees to make meaningful contributions. 54% um, uh, said that organizations should accept that they have a responsibility to give back. And then 46% said that employers should proactively sponsor OSS standards and projects for interoperability. All right, so now going down to the conclusions and kind of what I think are the most important findings from this data is that we can see asymmetrical open source use and contribution policies. There is a gap between use and contribution and organizations need to realize their responsibility that comes with use and contribution and that there should be steps followed before contributing or during um, using open source. It does help um, or it correlates with um, whether an organization has an OSPO or another OSS initiative to, to help with that. We also saw that um, our spent contributing do differ, but all of them are equally important um, as the little adds up, um, that there are non monetary benefits to contribution and uh, that the value of contribution doesn't necessarily tie into money and it has value for the organizations. Um, we also saw that there are limits which are also not tied to money uh, for contribution, for example, legal and licensing concerns. Um, also, we saw that the government has a special role in advancing open source and uh, that people feel like uh, organizations have a responsibility to give back to the open source community and that should start with allocating employee time to open source contributions and funding. Um, so, that was the end of it. Um, here's my contact information and there's already a Europe report up with just the European results on the Aleph Research website and the worldwide report will be published on the end of October. And another thing that the Linux Foundation research does is that we share all of our data on data.world um, so that people are able to reproduce our results. Um, so thank you and now I will open it for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is, there, is there any input on uh, what, what makes the companies to contribute code in the open source world? Like generally, I think logically thinking, the bigger companies get involved only when they have their strategic interests covered by being in the open source project. So is there, is there any kind of input on that from this survey to understand what is the impetus for companies to contribute in the open source? Mm -hmm. I think from our survey, what does come up is 
is kind of the innovation part of it so that they feel like even though there aren't direct returns right now on the innovation that is going on here in our company, be that some people are contributing to open source, um, they do see an innovation aspect to it as in, in, in the whole of the industry. Um, the other thing is that, as we saw, most of the time they are letting employees work on inner source projects or employer-related projects so that they do see an interest in the um, interest in contributing as maybe one, their whole open source software is dependent or their, their proprietary software is dependent on an open source project. Um, and then they contribute to that pro uh, project so that they are able to maintain their own proprietary prop, uh, uh, software. Um, I think these are probably the, the main reasons why and then I think, I, th I think it's not, we shouldn't underestimate also employers who just really see and feel a responsibility to give back, be it that they, they um, yes, they, they just feel a moral obligation, be it that they have before contributed to open source and then became a CEO of a company and then still trying to um, spread this evangelism. That could be too. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then I think it's, it's a huge challenge. Uh, and, and we know 85, 90% of the software is open source software. So I think it, probably the companies will rise up and try and start understanding that uh, you know, directly getting involved in open source world would be more advantageous. Mm. Uh, it's, it's probably that that is starting, I think. Yes. I, would say, yeah. I think, I think it is. Yet, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes. So uh, I've seen in this survey and some of the other surveys as well, um, organizations saying that uh, innovation, the desire for more innovation is one of the biggest drives. But uh, where, for a company that isn't recognizing that value quite yet, are there sources that you would recommend to prove that mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, but on one part, I would like them to see the surveys and the research result that we're doing so that they are able to see that other companies are thinking that, um, and then maybe they would feel a bit behind if, um, if they're able to see the results and they're like, oh, people are there already. This many people are having OSPOs. Um, but in terms of, I think, Probably just the, uh, the Linux Foundation's whole ecosystem. I think a lot of um, sub-foundations, such as the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, Hyperledger, do have these um, open source landscape maps and are really trying to show people that there are projects happening and, um, and hopefully leaders are able to see that how much their um, work is depending on it. Um, That's, that's a really good question, and I don't think I fully um, comprehended that when I first joined the Linux Foundation, which wasn't that long ago. It was in March. <laughs> and uh, I think it, it really depends. There are some foundations which started off as a separate entity and then uh, came to join the Linux Foundation, but still kind of have a different... Um, well, I can see it on their website, for example, that the website is a bit different, and then in the end you can see that, oh, it's part of the Linux Foundation. So I think it's, they are, it's, it's their own um, strategies or their own um, 
way of trying to figure out where to fit in this, but there are a lot of people, who, there are a lot of foundations which are part of the Linux Foundation um, and have like either fully, I, I'm not sure about the different joining processes and it could, it could be all the same, but this is what I've, uh, I've seen is that it might be very different for the different foundations. Um, and I'm sure that there are foundations which are not at all um, uh, related to the Linux Foundation. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm also happy to just have a, like people commenting, discussing. It doesn't have to be a question. <laughs> Can you bring some of those slides? Yeah. Back? Yeah. 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 I think it was this one. It was um, because on, one, on the one hand, I think probably the most uh, important limitation to contribution is this clear lack of of invest of a return of investment. Uh, but also at the same time, this graph suggests that organizations that kind of went beyond this and said, "Okay, we do see value. We would love to contribute, but they are still facing barriers." Um, and not able to allow contribution happening in their organizations because they are afraid of um, these specific things. And this really comes up in, for example, the financial services. We're also doing a, a research on that, which is a highly regulated industry. Um, and it can be seen that they are very, very careful. Um, even though, even if they would love to contribute, there are so many barriers to do that. But it just strikes me that maybe one of the and this is like that <laughs> um, maybe one of the issues is also um, has to do with uh, context changing for the engineers. Mm -hmm. Yes, unfortunately, this survey was very much organization focused, as in a lot of the questions are based on, um, is their organization doing this? Why do you think your organization's contribution is limited by, uh, et cetera? Um, there aren't a lot of personal level questions. There is one question about what are the motivators for you to contribute in your own personal time? Um, but there aren't really questions on, for example, why is, so on a personal level, why is contribution limited within your own working hours, um, even if you're allowed to? Um, so we did not have a question. Um, but I think probably there's gonna be a, there might be a very developer-focused survey coming up. It might happen. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll discuss with the, with the team. But I, um, 
Yes. Um, that I would love to see as well. But also, I think this survey is very good at showing that there are a lot of organizations seeing value um, and that this can be uh, used as kind of a, an evidence of, okay, let's either please continue what we're doing, which is contributing and uh, making sure that this ecosystem persists or, um, or trying to get there. No, that's so good because I feel like it's going to take a lot of different forms within their, uh, a specific company or a specific organization. Uh, and I think that there was even a talk about um, public, OSPOsing public sectors and how that's different from a, uh, from a company OSPO. So it just, yeah, it, it really depends on, on what, what each team needs and what, what each uh, company needs and feels like. Um, or how OSS can be incorporated into their their um, everyday. All right. Uh, if we are done discussing, I'm happy to let you go earlier. <laughs> but let me know if you if you need anything, and also just contact me if um, if there's anything uh, that you would like to discuss. Thank you.